this morning, and uh, we'll uh, unpack this uh, this morning. Romans chapter 5, verse number 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. For until the law was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law, nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Verse number four uh, almost seems like a word salad, but we're going to unpack that bit by bit as we go through it to talk about what verse 14 means. Now, uh, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we made it all the way to Romans chapter five. I can't wait to get to Romans six. It's so, so good. Probably one of my favorite chapters in all the book of Romans, but we got to get through five first, so stay with me. Uh, Romans chapter four, if we rewind a little bit, talks about justification by faith. Now, that word justification, Justification takes the context of a legal setting, okay? Imagine if it were a courtroom and you and I are on trial for the crime of breaking God's law, okay? That's what Romans 4 says. And you and I have already been predetermined as, how do we plead? Guilty as charged, 100%. Uh, We can make excuses for the wrong things we've done, or I didn't know, but hey, you and I are already predetermined guilty before God. Uh, Romans chapter 1 already did us a favor and told us that, that all the world might be guilty so that our mouths may be stopped before God. Uh, The Bible tells us in in Romans uh, 3 that we have sinned against God. We're all guilty, guaranteed. So in the courtroom... Our plea has already been entered, even if you enter a not guilty plea, it's already been determined that you're guilty, okay? Guilty, as charged. Now, your consequences, your sentence has also been predetermined, and that is, somebody help me, death, guaranteed, okay? Because you and I have been charged as guilty of breaking God's law, our penalty is death, You are going to die. But it's not simply that we're going to die on this earth. The Bible says there's coming a second death, if you're taking notes, Revelation chapter 20. After this, it's appointed unto man wants to die. After this, the judgment. We're going to die, and where we go when we die is determined on our penalty. Our penalty says we're all going to die and go to hell. That's what we deserve. That's what has been determined by God, and there's no appeal We will not stand, this is important to note too, we will not stand before God one day and argue our case. There is no like, hey God, I want to tell you I did this, this, and this, and God's going to factor that into the equation. No, no, no. It's really cut and dried. You're guilty, uh, your penalty is death, and not only death on this earth, but death in hell forever. That's already determined. But here's what God has done. Romans 5, 8, God commendeth or demonstrates his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God says somebody or something has to die, and Jesus Christ has said, I will die on their behalf. And so God has allowed one person and one person only, and that's Jesus, to die in our place. Because here's the problem. I can't die in your place because I, too, am also guilty of breaking God's law. And so it's not like one of us can pay for one another. We can't do that. But Jesus, who has never sinned, can pay the penalty of death in our place. And so that's precisely what happened. Jesus Christ came, died on the cross to pay for my sin and pay for yours. And then when he was done, he said, incredible words, it is finished. I've done everything that's necessary to pay for the sins of mankind. All they have to do is believe on me, Jesus Christ. And so, if you're willing to recognize your standing before God the way that God describes it, you've broken God's law, you've been predetermined as guilty, you recognize that you deserve to go to hell, but you're willing to allow Jesus to pay the penalty for you, and you put your faith in Jesus as Savior, he can do that work, but also as Lord. I'm going to follow Jesus now because he has paid my penalty then you can be saved from your sin. 
We call it being saved. We call it being born again. Uh, Those words are synonymous in the Bible. They mean the exact same thing. But the only way you can be saved, the only way you can be born again, the only way you can get to heaven is by putting your faith in Jesus alone to save you. Okay? Because in the legal standing, you're guilty and the penalty's already been predetermined. But Jesus can pay that penalty for you. So here's what happens. When I was a nine-year-old boy, I recognized my need for Jesus. It was a Sunday morning before we were getting ready for church. My dad came to my room. We walked through the Bible, the gospel. I prayed a prayer as a nine-year-old boy. Now, I hadn't committed any gross, heinous sin by then, but I recognized I have broken God's law. I have rebelled against God. I deserve to go to hell and ask God as a nine-year-old boy to save me from my sin, and he did. Because the Bible says if anybody believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth, that God will save them in a split second. I didn't have to be in church. Uh, I didn't have to, to walk an aisle. Uh, I didn't have to go through any religious process. I just had to put my faith in Jesus. And for you, there has to be a time, a date, and a place where you put your faith in Jesus. Well, well my mom told me I'm good. You will not stand before God with your mom. Well, well, my pastor told me that I'm good. You will not stand before God with your pastor. Well, I think I got baptized as a kid. Your baptism could never wash away your sins because God didn't say the penalty of your sin, okay, you're guilty, your penalty is baptism. That's not what he said. He said, you have to die or someone has to die for you. That's the only option. And so for me, when I put my faith in Jesus and for all of you who have put your faith in Jesus to save you from your sins, that day in a legal standing in God's courtroom, he declared you, this is super important, so you should pay attention. He didn't declare you not guilty. He declared you righteous. There's a big difference. Not guilty basically means maybe there wasn't enough evidence to convict you, which there's plenty, trust me. It's not a matter of like, well, we uh, got off on a technicality. There are no technicalities that could get you off, for sure. God says, you're not guilty of doing anything wrong. You're actually found as doing everything right instead. Wait, what? Yeah, yeah. Not only not guilty, but you've been declared righteous. Well, how does that happen? Justification. Let me explain this to you. And again, I want you, I don't want you to be, to be a church that's like, hey, I think I'm going to heaven. I, I think I'm pretty sure of that. I want you to be a church that knows the Bible. I want you to be a church that can explain your faith to another person. I want you to understand the deep inner workings of the gospel. And we can't just gloss over a word like justification and say, well, it's just like I never sinned. No, it's way deeper than that. So here's how God takes you from being declared guilty to declared righteous. Not you've done everything wrong, but instead you've done everything right. Here's how it happens. God took your sin, my sin, and he placed it on Jesus Christ. And when he who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, became sin for us, God had to punish Jesus. So when Jesus took my sin and yours upon him, God had no choice but to punish him. The crucifixion was God's punishment on Jesus Christ because he had my sin and yours upon him. And so when Jesus took our sin upon him and he paid it in full, then he was able to take his righteousness, all the right that Jesus has done, and apply it to you and I. We sometimes refer to this as the beautiful exchange. I put my sin on Jesus. He puts his righteousness upon me. And now I'm declared righteous in the sight of God. This is called justification. Okay? So in a legal standing, all of those who have put their faith in Jesus have been declared righteous. So that when God looks at you, when God looks at me, he doesn't see Anthony King, the dirty, rotten, despicable, filthy, disgusting, vile sinner, which is who I am. He sees me as his righteous son who is his purchased possession. How does that happen? Because you and I, the word justified literally means right clothing. We're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so you and I are justified by faith. That's the whole idea behind Romans chapter 4. And so if you take a look in our text this morning, Romans chapter 5, verse number 9, much more than being now justified, declared righteous by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now you and I will never go to hell. Now you and I will never experience God's punishment for sin because Jesus was already punished for my sin, past, present, future. 
when I go to heaven, I don't have to go to heaven fearful that like, oh man, now I've got to answer to God for all the wrong that I've done. No, no, no. Jesus already answered for all the wrong that I've done when he died upon the cross. That's why Jesus says, this is finished, like done. God's payment has been fulfilled. Your soul has been purchased. You owe God nothing for the wrong that you've done. Well, does that mean that I can keep sinning as much as I want to and continue to get away with it? Huh, that's Romans chapter 6 for you. The answer to that is a big, fat no. Not only a no, God forbid, is what, what Romans 6 tells us. So now you and I are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are declared righteous. And then it goes on in verse number 10. It says, for if... When we were enemies, you and I used to be enemies of God, but now we're reconciled to God by the death of his son. And so justification deals with our legal standing before God, whereas reconciliation deals with the nature of our relationship. So it's important to understand these theological terms. Justification is my legal standing before God, but that my legal standing doesn't change the fact that I'm still an enemy of God. Because I still am at odds with God unless I have submitted to following Jesus. And so I have been justified, declared righteous. But now, now that I've been declared righteous, I'm also reconciled and brought back into a right relationship with God. Reconciliation is the restoration of a broken relationship. It's a renewal of a friendship. Hey, things were messed up between me and God, and now they have been made right. That's what Jesus Christ has done through reconciliation. So Romans 5 tells us here, verse number 10, that you and I were the enemies of God. Oftentimes, most people who, before they get saved, don't consider themselves enemies of God. They can do with or without God. I was talking to somebody this week, and, I, and uh, they were talking about their relationship there, and I said, is your boyfriend a Christian? She says, no, he's like anti-God. Oh, that's super unhealthy, especially if you're a Christian. Um, if you're a Christian, you shouldn't date non-Christians. I'm just going to throw that out there as just free advice from the Bible. Um, so she's like, no, he's anti-everything. So some people would determine themselves as the enemies of God. Other people would determine themselves like, well, I don't follow God, but I'm not necessarily against him. The Bible says you're an enemy of God, okay? Really important to understand because Jesus says you're either for me or you're against me. The Bible goes so far as this, like, well, I'm not that bad of a person. I, I don't really know that I need to be saved. I don't know that I need Jesus. I don't know that my sin is so bad that I need to die and burn in hell over it, right? Is it that big of a deal? Well, first of all, Romans 5, 10, you are an enemy of God. You are a child of wrath. You're a child of disobedience. And you do your work of your father, the devil, okay? That's how God sees you. Well, I don't see myself that way. Look, when you die, how you view yourself will be inconsequential to the way that God views you. And so if God says that you're these things, you need to really like perk up and say, okay, what do I need to do to make this right? Jesus is the only thing that can make this right. It's not a matter of doing more, going to church more, trying to, to behave yourself. Jesus is the only thing that can make these things right. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now that Jesus has shed his blood on the cross for your sins, God is able to bring you near to him. The things that were broken, you were once an enemy. Guess what? You're now welcomed. You're now a son. Now you're a daughter of God. Reconciliation gives us the capability to be called the sons and daughters of God. I don't know if you've ever had anybody in your life that you considered an enemy. Uh, and here's sometimes the misconception that people have. Because someone is your enemy doesn't mean that you have ill feelings against them. Sometimes there's people who just hate your guts and want to see you fail. According to the dictionary definition, these are people who uh, seek to see you fail or do you harm. That's the idea of an enemy. So it doesn't mean that you necessarily uh, reciprocate the feelings. So if you've ever had anybody in your life who hates your guts, um, you have an enemy. For me, I've got a laundry list of people that continues to grow, people who hate my guts. But um, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But imagine this. Someone who hates your guts wants, wants to see you uh, brought down or just to do you harm in some way or some fashion. And then finally, they come to their senses and say, okay, you're not that bad of a guy. Hey, man, I'm sorry for all the, the wrong that I did. I'm sorry for the ill feelings I had towards you. I'm sorry for the lies that I told you about you or the way that I wanted to do you harm. Will you forgive me for that? Most of us would, if we're walking with Jesus, would say, sure, I forgive you. Hey, do you mind if I come over for dinner this Friday night? And I was thinking like every Friday night until like I die. Could I come over for dinner? Hmm. <sighs> I'm forgiving you, but don't push your luck, right? Like, No. 
Um, okay, maybe one time. Okay, maybe if I'm feeling gracious. And so we, we have difficulty wrapping our brain around this idea that you and I would have been the enemy of God and God not only welcomes you to his table on a Friday night, but like on a Saturday morning and a Saturday for lunch. And God not only uh, does that, but God sets up residence with you and God invites you in. God makes you his own and he cares for you as his own son and as his own daughter when you used to be an enemy. That's reconciliation. That's what only reconciliation could do. And understand this, that type of reconciliation is a model for you and I to follow when other people who seek to do us harm seek forgiveness. We should also seek reconciliation as well. And again, just life pro tip here. The Bible says, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Hey, from your end, there should be no ill will, no hard feelings, no sin. Everything should be confessed on the up and up. Some people just love drama and want to fight. The Bible says, let them go, let them do their thing. You don't have to be involved in that. But live peaceably with all men as much as life in you. But God wants reconciliation. This is God's way. And uh, reconciliation with God is only available through Jesus Christ. And so again, when it comes to theological terms, justification is the opposite of condemnation, okay? Condemnation means that you are guilty of your sins and you will pay the penalty for it. The opposite of that is you have no sin, all your sin has been paid for, and you will never uh, receive any retribution for that. When it comes to reconciliation, the opposite of reconciliation is alienation. Reconciliation takes us from being, being the enemies of God to now being the sons and daughters of God. And you want to talk about flipping the script. One person who once was an enemy of God, now is a son, now is a daughter of God. How long does that reconciliation take? About as long as it takes for you to call on the name of Jesus. See, we have this idea that's not a biblical idea, that when you and I decide to come back to God or to turn to God the first time, it's kind of a process that we got to go through. That maybe God's kind of checking your heart to find out if you're really on the right path or not. Do you really mean that you're sorry or not? Well, we'll wait and see because that's how we are. We automatically assume that God is, is constrained by the own, same limitations of our carnal hearts. He's not. When we come to God and say, God, save me from my sin. I put my faith in you and I want to follow your son, Jesus. God, in a split second, sees your heart and he brings you in. He brings you near. It's not a matter of like, well, we'll see about that. We'll see where you're at in six months. How about that? No, 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 no. And again, we have this mistaken idea of God in that way as well when we come back to God after we've been living in our sin, right? Well, I've got to prove to God that I'm coming back. I've got to prove to God that I really mean this. You know, I, I'm slowly coming back to God. Here's what the Bible says. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you confess your sin to God, boom, it is over because it's under the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to make it this big, huge, long, drawn-out process, you can do that, but God's not doing that. The Bible says if you draw nigh unto God, that he will draw nigh unto you. The second that you take a step towards the Father, he comes running. And if you don't know the story of the prodigal son that Jesus tells where the Father sees the son coming and he runs, God the Father is the father of that story. And so all you and I, when, to come back to God, all we have to do is confess our sin, and he is immediately back with us because we have been reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18 says, For Christ hath also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might do what? Bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive or quickened by the Spirit. And so now we've been re reconciled to God. Now we can be called sons and daughters. We can call God Father. You might not know this, and if you don't, I want to inform you. If you are not a child of God, if you have never been saved or born again, you don't have the right to call God Father. You don't. He's not your father. You are his enemy. You are under his punishment. Well, I thought God was the father of everybody. God is the father of all creation, but God doesn't make that doesn't make God your father. You come to God and make him your father by confessing his son. And we confess Jesus as Savior and Lord. We're adopted into God's family, and he makes us sons and daughters. So, verse number 11 tells us that once we've been reconciled to God and we're saved by the, the work of Jesus Christ, verse 11 says, not only so... We also joy in God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have received the atonement. Important to note that word atonement can be used interchangeably with reconciliation. Easy way I, I was taught once upon a time to remember atonement is it means at one meant. Uh, that you and I are at one with God. We've been reconciled to God through the atonement, uh, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so this new standing that we have of being called sons and daughters and no longer enemies of God, our new standing with God will bring us joy. Take a look at verse number 11 in your text. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we've now received the atonement. Joy is different than happiness. I read a definition one time that stuck with me. It had been really helpful in my life. Joy is happiness based on spiritual realities. We sometimes think that joy is tied to our circumstances. Joy is completely and totally separate from any circumstances that you have. You could have 24 hours to live and still have joy. You have your body filled with cancer and still have joy. You can be $100,000 overdrawn on your checking account and still have joy. Joy is not tied to your circumstances. Joy is tied to the person of Jesus Christ. And so because I'm a son, because I'm a daughter, I I have joy now. Because I am in part of the family of God, I have joy now. Well, Well, things are going rough at work right now. That's fine. You can still have joy. Well, my kids are in a mess right now. That's fine. You can still have joy. All my finances are are, are messed up. That's fine. You can sell joy. Well, I don't know what's going to happen with this situation. Fine. Joy is totally separate from that because joy comes from the Holy Spirit of God. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Yeah, second one. You got it. So joy comes because of who God is. Hey, things are rocky at work right now, but I'm a child of God. I know where I'm going when I die. I have... (laughs) Things are a little bit turbulent in life right now, but I'm thankful that God has left me a book full of his promises to me. That I can find peace, that I can find joy, that I can find encouragement in every single day of the week. 66 books full of promises to me, and I can have joy in Jesus. Faith in our Father brings true contentment and joy. Look, if I tell you something, it may or may not come to pass. It may or may not be true. But if your father says it, you can take it to the bank. Faith in God will bring you that lasting contentment that your heart craves. We have joy in God through Jesus Christ who has brought us into the presence of the Father. The problem with our society and the world that we live in today is we look for joy and contentment everywhere but God. I want joy in my job. You may or may not get it. Hey, believe it or not, there's times in life where you just got to grind out a nine to five because you're just there to do a job to to glorify God. Simple as that. Well, I want to do something that's fulfilling. Yeah, and there may be days where you get to do that, maybe days where you just got to grind it out and do your work. But we do it to glorify God because at the end of the day, my contentment is not found always in my vocation. My contentment comes in my relationship with the Father. My contentment can't come from, from having all my bills paid or money in the bank or what the doctor has to say about the last test that I had or any of those other things. My contentment has to come in saying that Jesus Christ is enough. I, I'm, I'm thankful to, to be a, a ridiculously blessed man. God has given me an amazing wife, uh, given me four incredible children. I'm, I'm like way blessed in the family department. But did you know this? If God took my family away tomorrow, I still have reason to joy. I have some reason to be grateful because my joy is not tied to something that God's given me. My joy is tied to the person of who God is, my father. You see, we, we run into problems many times when, when Jesus Christ is not enough. I want God because of the stuff that he gives me. God, you know, God gives me contentment. God helps me pay my bills. God helps me maintain my marriage. God helps me to raise my kids. And God's provided a car for me. God's provided a good job for me. God's, uh, you know, uh, given me good health care and a good health care program. God's given me, a, you know, a good career track and things like that. And I love God because of all the stuff that he's given me. Be careful because what often happens is I don't really love God. I just love the stuff that he gives And I don't really want more of God in my life. I want more of God's stuff in my life. 
and then we've, we flipped it on where we're supposed to be. God gives you those things because he's gracious, because he's merciful, because he desires glory, not because he wants you to have more stuff. And so I love what Psalm 33 says, for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. And so again, the source of our contentment, the source of our joy is in the fact that I know that who I am in Christ. Contentment is found in who I am in Christ. Please understand, my identity is not tied to my vocation. Well, tell me about who you are. I am a child of God, first and foremost. That's it. Other roles that God has allowed me to fulfill, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a pastor, I'm a son, I'm a friend, I'm a brother. These are all roles that I have. But my identity comes from first and foremost that I am a child of God. How I am a child of God, how well I follow my father, determines all of the other roles that he's given me and the success and failure of those roles. If I'm a crummy child of God, I can guarantee you I'm going to be a crummy husband, a crummy father, a crummy friend, a terrible pastor, because my identity must be found in Jesus Christ. And he informs all those other areas. That will help us because we won't get disappointed when our career doesn't go the way that we thought that it would or I don't get this thing that I thought I was going to get or people don't clap for me the way I thought they clap for me and people aren't happy for me when I do this or that. That's fine. I'm just a child of God and I'm just trying to please my father. That's it. I, I, I don't live for the praise of other people. I, I don't care what you think about me. I care about what my father thinks about me. Yeah. Now, I, I've, I've met some terrible Christians before who say, I don't care what you think about me. I just care what my father thinks about me. Your father thinks that you're a reprehensible Christian, you know. <laughs> well, that's awfully judgy. No, 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 it's not, it's not. Please understand, when you tell people Bible truth, that's not judgment. That's just reciting scripture, okay. <laughs> I was talking to a guy one time, you know. Hey, Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he goes, I don't like how you interpreted that verse. I didn't interpret it. I just quoted it. You know, it's like <laughs> Jesus says he's the only way to the Father. Well, I don't like your interpretation. It's not an interpretation. It's a quote. And so, uh, again, when the, the idea of like, well, well, nobody else can judge me but God. You know, I, I saw a guy one time who had on his neck uh, tattooed, only God can judge me. And I thought to myself, if you really knew what that meant, that would terrify you. Like, like if you really knew that like you will stand in judgment before God one day, from what the Bible says, every idle word spoken, like it would terrify me to know that I stand in danger of God's judgment. And so, but it, sometimes we can say, well, I don't care what other people think about me. I just care about God. That's a, that's a good and it's bad. It's good in the fact that you don't live for the praise of men, but we also want to let our light so shine before men that may see our Father should heaven and glorify him. And so I want to live in a way that glorifies my Father. But at the end of the day, if you don't like the fact that I'm living for glorifying the Father, that, that's between you and the devil. Uh, but anyways, our Father, some of you got that joke and some of you didn't. God bless those that laughed. Uh, uh, anyways, back to the Bible. Um, that's always helpful. When it comes to being sons and daughters, we're no longer enemies of God. We're no longer estranged, but we're made, made sons and daughters and we're brought near. God didn't save us to just leave us alone. And this is, this is an important thing to note, too. God didn't just save you and say, all right, buddy, go ahead, and uh, I'll see you when you get to heaven, and just, like, run along. No, no, no. God, when he saved you, brought you near to him. And that's where you're supposed to stay, near to your father. Your father has a kingdom that he is building, and you now have been brought into your father's kingdom. You're no longer living in the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of your sin. You're, you've been brought near into the kingdom of your father, and you and I are to learn to be good sons and daughters who live under the umbrella of your father's kingdom. And so you once were outside throwing rocks at the kingdom. You once were outside lobbing grenades at the kingdom as the enemies of God. You were once living in the kingdom of your sin for the devil, but God has brought you near. And here's what God's done. He's not just be like, all right, fine, come on in. No, no, no. He welcomes you in and brings you near, and he gives you his name. And he says, you're mine. You're mine. 
Come have a seat at my table. I've got great things planned for you. And so you and I, this reconciliation that we find through Jesus Christ, it's such a special gift. Now as we go to verse number 12, we see that Adam was the man who brought sin upon the world that we live in today. All creation suffers due to sin. All of it. Romans chapter 8, verse number 22 says, We now know that all creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Sometimes people ask me as a pastor, and sometimes they want this really deep theological, you know, explanation. Hey, why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there so much suffering in the world that we live in today? And there's one answer and one answer only, and that is sin. That's it. Sin ruins everything. Why did that family fall apart down the street? Sin. Guaranteed you. Uh, Why did that guy leave his family? Sin. Guaranteed you. Uh, why it did you know somebody stab somebody down in Waikiki last night? Sin, guaranteed. Uh, why do people uh, suffer with you know chronic illness? Sin. Now again, is sin the reason people are, are got sick with cancer? No, it's not necessarily the case. But because we live in a sin cursed world, everything is about death, destruction, and decaying. That's what this life that we live, all creation is now under this curse. The Bible tells us that uh, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, and God says, Adam, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18, the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And what happened? The devil tempted Eve, Eve ate, and she gave it to Adam, Adam ate, and the Bible says that their eyes were open, and the process of death began. They were immediately separated from God in a spiritual death. Their soul was dead, and they would eventually physically die. This process of death is part of uh, the sin curse. Death is a direct result of Adam's sin and the brokenness brought into this world. So again, why do bad things happen to good people? I, I, again, if I have time to explain to people this, I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper and I'll say this. First of all, none of us are good. <laughs> the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Somebody even called Jesus a good teacher. And he's like, whoa, 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 what do you mean by that? You called me good. The only one who's good is God. And so all of us are sinners and we live in a sin-cursed world. That's why, uh, you know, bad things happen because of sin. You take a, a, a child who's stillborn. What happened? Sin. Well, did that child sin, and that's why this happened? We'll get to that in a minute, but the answer, the short answer is no. But because of sin, that's why there's so much suffering in the world today. We take a look at everything that's going on in the Middle East right now, in Israel and Gaza and all that other stuff. Uh, what, what's the result of that? The result is of it is generational sin taking place there. Sin is the, the, the root cause of it. What keeps us from finding peace, not only between nations, but in our own home? Sin, 100% of the time, every single time. And so because we live in a cursed, fallen world, uh, this is just the way that we live. That's Suffering is rampant. And the only way that you and I will get away from suffering is to go to a place where there is no sin. Where is that place? Heaven. That's why we, as Christians, realize, hey, I'm just here for a period of time And hey, it might get bad, it might get worse, but I'm going to a place where there is no sin and there is no suffering forever. And so this is just a temporary stopover from point A to point B. And so why is there suffering in the world? Sin. Why do bad things happen to, quote, good people? Sin. Suffering. It's the world we live in. It's the curse that we live under. But it's to remind us that there's coming a day for those of us who God has adopted into his family that we will go to a place where there is no sin and no more pain. And that's in heaven with the Father. But until then, the Bible says, all creation groans under the weight of the brokenness of sin. Adam brought sin into the world, but sin itself originated with Satan. So again, we see in verse number 12, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. But John tells us in 1 John chapter 3, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. 
so again, we go back to the, the idea of, you know, before you met Christ and were born again, you weren't a child of God because the Bible says th- those that live in sin, they're of the devil. And so before you were saved, you're the enemy of God, child of wrath, child of disobedience of your father, the devil, and you're doing the works of the devil. So again, this is why God just can't let you s- squeeze through because you did a few nice things. You have to be brought to peace with God, reconciliation through Jesus Christ. You and I understand that the devil was the originator of sin. He rebelled against God in heaven and was cast out of heaven. He was the, the tempter in the Garden of Eden. Before Adam ever sinned, Satan already had w- was the epitome of sin. And so that originated with Satan, but Adam brought this sin into the world and his brokenness has now passed upon everyone. And because of Adam's sin, Adam brought not only sin into the world, but he also brought death into the world. And in this world, death reigns over all. No one has defeated death apart from one person. Death is the undisputed world champion. Of the 8 billion people that are alive today, death will swallow up 100% of them in the next 125 years. Guaranteed. 100%. I will die, you will die. And for some people, that's a terrifying thought. But the Bible says for us as Christians, it's actually a comfort. Isn't that crazy? It's like God takes the whole world the way that you and I see it, and he flips it upside down. God takes his enemies who hate his guts, and instead of God, you know, lobbing grenades back, God brings them near and calls them sons and daughters. We take this thing, which is death, that everybody fears, that everybody's afraid of, that everybody's trying to squeeze out a little bit of extra to. And God says, oh, I'm going to take this thing, and it's going to be a cause of great encouragement for you. You won't be discouraged. You won't be sad by death. You'll actually see it as a promotion, as your new life really beginning. But for this world, man, death reigns. All will die for all have sinned. If you have sinned, you're going to die. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So again, If I'm on the enemy's side, I see death as something to be feared. It's the end for me. I've got to get as much as I can between now and whenever the end is. And because these bodies come with an expiration date, which is not printed anywhere where we can read it, I don't know how much time I've got left. So if I'm an enemy of God, I'm just trying to figure out how I can squeeze the most out of this life in whatever time I got left. Uh, I turned 46 years old this year. I know I look like I'm 66, but I'm 46. But I turned 46. I could say, hey, wait a minute. That means, according to life expectancy in the United States, I've only got about 30 years left. I can't afford a week being sad because I only got like, uh, I don't know, like 150 weeks left. No, that's bad math. It's uh, 1,500 weeks left. I might have have 150 left. I only have 1,500 weeks left. I can't have a bad week. Because i got to squeeze as much time as I can out of these last weeks. I might only have 10 weeks. I'm not going to live it being sad like this. I need to do what makes me happy. And I've sat across the table from so many people who say, Pastor, I deserve to be happy. No, you don't. You deserve to be holy. Well, my Time's getting short. I'm getting older. I'm, I'm sick of living this life. I want to do what's best for me now. Oh, no, 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 you don't. I promise you don't. But death has this way of skewing our perspective, doesn't it? Oh, if you found out that you only had a week to live, what would you do differently? Honestly, I don't know that I would do anything differently. I I really don't. Because I made a decision about 20 years ago. I'm going to live every single week of my life like it is my last week. There's no relationships that I need to mend. Nobody I need to call and apologize. Nobody I need to call and and tell them that I love them and I care about them and I'm going to miss them because they already know those things because I've been living with the end in mind all this time anyways because I know that death is coming and that is an encouragement to me. I don't don't fear death. 
Uh, I'm not trying to die. I still wear a seatbelt. I still wait for the, the green man to flash on the crosswalk before I cross. Like, I'm not trying to die. Um, but I, I don't fear it. It doesn't have any power over me. You know why? Because my Savior already defeated death. I don't fear my sin. You know why? Because my Savior already defeated sin. And so the only one who has ever defeated death is Jesus Christ. And Jesus offers that victory now to you and I. Oh, you're my son. Oh, you're my daughter. Yeah, the physical death, that's just the beginning of your eternal life. So if you're a child of God today, you can say with 100% certainty, when I die, heaven's my home. The Bible says to be absent with the, from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. I know that when I take my last breath here on planet Earth, I'm with Jesus, 100%, guaranteed. I know that as, as sure as I am standing here. How can you have so much faith? Because my faith is in the Word of God and the Son of God. That's it, 100% certain. So I don't, I don't fear death. Now, do I want to be able to walk my daughters down the aisle when they're 55? I do. Um, and so... They can start dating when they're 45, and a 10-year engagement to 55 is, I'm good, okay? Uh, my boys need to, like, get on it. But uh, my girls, I'll, I'll give them some time, all right? Uh, but do I want to do those things? Sure, I do. But if I don't get to, I'm with Jesus. Like, th that's a comfort to me for those that know the Lord. And so while death came, and it was, it's the curse of mankind, my Savior has defeated that curse. My Savior has liberated me from curse. While I'm still in this fleshly body, I still will continue to sin. But that sin doesn't have power over me. That sin doesn't have the stronghold on me that it used to because I've been delivered. I've been set free. It's what Romans chapter 6 tells me from my sin. And so that curse been defeated by my Savior. Next we see in verse number 13 and 14. Take a look at that. For the law, until the law was the, in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So let me break this down for you. Before the Mosaic law, there were no specific commandments given, but mankind's sin nature is still punishable by death. Let's unpack that big, huge, wordy statement. God told Adam, do not eat of that tree in the center of the garden. The day that you eat of it, you will die. That's one commandment and one commandment only, and Adam just couldn't keep it. He broke it, okay? From Adam all the way to Moses, there were no more commandments other than that one specific command, right? Then God gives Moses 10 commandments to obey. Everybody with me so far? No commandments in this period of time. So Adam and Eve have two boys, Cain, Abel. Cain makes a sacrifice, kills an animal, makes it before God. No, I mean, Abel makes a sacrifice, kills it before God. Cain grabs some berries and some leaves and, and offers that as a sacrifice to God. Further indication that God loves carnivores. Um, but that was a joke and nobody got it. It was a really good joke. Um, and so anyways... One son, Abel, had an acceptable sacrifice. Cain had an unacceptable sacrifice before God. And Cain got angry and killed his brother. Okay? Mind you, there's only one commandment. Don't eat of the tree. Did what Cain do by killing his brother, was that still sin? Of course it was. Cain knew it too. Hey, Cain, where's your brother? I, I don't know. What am I, my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to know where my brother's at all the time? I don't know where he's at. And God says, hmm, I know where your brother's at because his blood cries at me from the earth. Oh, man, Cain knew that he had messed up. How did he know that? There wasn't a commandment against killing, but God's law is still in effect even without a specific law, and man's sin nature is still in effect even without specific commandments. So when it says that, that death reigned from Adam to Moses, everybody still died through there because they were still filled with a sin nature. And so that sin nature got passed on from generation to generation to generation, and they still died even though there weren't any specific commandments yet. 
They didn't sin by eating of the tree like Adam and Eve did, but they still died because Adam brought sin nature and death into the world, and sin and death reigned. Does that make sense? So while there were no specific commands, man continued to sin and rebel against God. It's important to note, too, this is kind of a good place to, to stop and park for a second and talk about this. When Adam's sin and Adam's sin nature is passed along to you and I, sometimes the, the idea of original sin gets mixed in. This is why it's really important to define what we're talking about in terms. Man didn't sin because Adam ate fruit that he wasn't supposed to, okay? And that original sin of eating fruit, prohibited fruit, caused mankind, now you and I, to die and suffer and all this other stuff. That sin didn't get passed on to you and I where you and I now eat forbidden fruit. But that nature of Adam to, get this, rebel against God got passed on to everyone else. So we're not paying the price for the original sin. We're paying the price for our sin nature, which was a result of eating prohibited fruit which the problem wasn't the fruit. The fruit wasn't poisonous. The problem was a rebellion against God. And you know what? My number one problem, and I'm guessing probably your number one problem too when it comes to our sin with God, rebellion against God. Hey, I just want to do what I want to do. That's all. Uh, Again, when you sat in my chair, and you sat across the table from somebody, you hear the, the most foolish, heinous things you'll ever hear in your entire life, and you hear people say things like, I know that it's wrong, I just want to do what I want to do. No, you don't understand how this works. Oh no, pastor, I do. <laughs> Guarantee you don't. Because every man is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth what? Death. 100% of the time. It's not like I'm going to do my sin and then something good's going to come out of it. No, 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 no. Sin always leads to death and destruction 100% of the time. And when you say, I'm going to sin but expect God good things, you think that you can cheat God's system. That's precisely what Adam thought, and that's precisely why you and I are in the mess that we're in, because we think we can cheat God's system. I can do what I want to do, and there's not going to be any ramifications for it. Friend, no sin goes unpunished. Guaranteed. So that sin nature now gets passed along to you and I. So why? what about a child who's born, stillborn? Did that child sin? No, that child didn't sin, but that child was born into a fallen nature of parents with a sin nature. And that child, given the opportunity to draw breath in this life, would have rebelled against God the first opportunity it got. Because we are a broken, fallen creation. Just where we are. And so now, the Bible tells us, Adam now becomes a picture. Take a look in verse number uh, 14 now. So, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even though there weren't specific commandments, even though them that had not sinned the same way that Adam did. And Adam is a figure of him that was to come. Then we get into this beautiful thing that we see coming later in Romans 5. We've been studying on, on Sunday nights as well. Adam becomes a picture of Jesus Christ. And so this is what we refer to as typology. This is what we're doing on Sunday nights taking a look at tonight how Noah and the ark point us toward, towards Jesus Christ. Adam was a man, one man who came into the world who ruined everything for everybody. And Jesus Christ became the one man who came into the world who fixed everything that Adam had broken and made everything right for everybody. And so Adam is a picture of the person who's coming in Jesus Christ. Has been since the, the creation of the world. We'll get into that after we get in deeper down in Romans chapter 5. Now, I want to give you some practical guidance on how do we take what we've learned today and put it into practice. The Bible says that knowledge puffs up. The, the more that you and I get smarter and we can throw around words like justification and reconciliation and propitiation, then, then our chest swells and we're like super smart now and I know more about the Bible than you do. That's, that's bad. What we want to do is we want the, the knowledge that we gain from the Bible to change our hearts and change the way that we live. That's the whole purpose of the Bible. Read the Bible for 
application, not just information, okay? So what do we do with this? First of all, understand that Jesus Christ is our life. We find our earthly life in Jesus. Friend, if you have never lived for Jesus, let me tell you, you are missing out on the best thing in life. He is better than I can explain. He's better than I can fathom. There's not enough words in the English language to explain how good Jesus is. The joy that you will have when you're walking with and obeying and loving Jesus cannot be quantified. It cannot be described other than to simply experience it. You want joy in your marriage? Walk with Jesus like you never have before as a married couple and your, your joy will run over. You want, marriage, you, want, you want joy as a single adult? Man, walk with Jesus like you never have before and you'll be like, yeah, if I get married one day, so what? I just love Jesus. Because again, the, I, I've come across so many single adults and it's tragic to watch that, hey, I'm willing to obey Jesus if Jesus is going to get me a ring on my finger or Jesus is going to get me down the aisle to get married. I'm willing to follow him, but the second that I realize it's not going the direction that I want, then I'm going to pull back and I'm going to go try to find it on, on the internet or find some, on some app because Jesus wasn't enough. The problem is, is you, you're pursuing Jesus' stuff, not pursuing Jesus. That's a problem. But when you make Jesus your life, like everything in my life is built around Jesus, I'm telling you, your, your heart will explode with joy and contentment like you've never known before. My wife and I, uh, after we separated from the military, we had a computer training consulting company here that we did for a couple of years, and we made a ridiculous amount of money. I was 24 years old and making six figures, set my own schedule, going to work when I wanted to and not going to work when I didn't. And I thought that that would provide some level of contentment. Like, hey, I'm doing things that people only dream of doing. I'm making money that I never thought I'd make in my entire life. Where is the contentment? It wasn't found in owning your own business or having a lot of money or being able to take a couple of weeks off at a time. Everything changed for us when when we decided to put Jesus at the top of everything in our life, then everything else kind of fell into place. <laughs> it's just like money, I can do with it or out without money. I don't really care about that anymore. I don't really care about the kind of car that I drive or, or what people think of me. I, I care about what my father thinks of me. I care about how I can glorify my father and please him. And so I'm telling you this, walking with Jesus will be the greatest joy of your life if you'll just do it. And, and, and let me ex explain this to you as well, that when... Anytime you s decide to live for yourself and rebel against your father, when you do that, you forfeit joy 100% of the time. Well, I can do what I want. You will never find joy when you do what you want, only when you do what the father wants. And, and when you think about it that way, Jesus says to a group of people, he says, I do only the things that please my father. If that was Jesus' mindset, I think you and I would do well to adopt the same mindset, but you will find your life in Jesus Christ. The problem with many people is that Jesus is one of the many things that they do. You know, I go to church, I go to the gym, I go to work, I hang out with friends, you know, uh, we had a barbecue on Friday night, you know, we went out, and, uh, went out to Waikiki and went to the beach on, on Saturday, and then we went to church on Sunday, and church kind of gets mixed in with all the stuff that I do. And the problem is, is when life gets busy, it's just like, oh, yeah, I didn't make it to church because it's been a crazy week this week. Like, I didn't even go to the gym this week. And it's like, oh, you're putting your corporate worship of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords on par with, like, whether or not you, like, made it to the elliptical this week. Like, that shows, again, lays bare your heart. But when we get this thing right, when we get it right, and I'll confess, there was a while that I didn't do it right, but I, I got it right. Jesus is at the center of everything that I do, and everything flows out of Jesus. Everything. My time at the gym, I enjoy going to the gym, but I'm looking for people that need Jesus at the gym, right? I'm listening to music on my headphones that edifies Jesus, that causes my heart to be drawn towards the things of God, not the things of this world. My workplace, I want to see that as an opportunity. This is a mission field. I'm around people that don't know Jesus. People are like, oh, pastor, pray for me. You worked really hard. I've worked with a bunch of non-Christians. Praise God. Good for you. You get to be light in your workplace. You are the only Christian in your entire workspace. What a mission field. Like Dave Board had to go to Cambodia to find that. And you got a whole office full of them. What a treat. No, Pastor, it's not like that. It's hard. Oh, but it's easier in Cambodia, right? I mean, come on. No, 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 no. That's a gift because now when Jesus is at the center, my workplace becomes my mission. 
I'm, I'm going to my workplace as part of the go in, baptize, teach. I'm going to my workplace. I see my, my work as worship. It's a way for me to glorify the Father. The people that I hang out with, my friends that I'm barbecuing with on the weekends or going to the beach with, these are either Christian friends that help me grow in my faith to love Jesus more, or they're people that I'm trying to bring into to Jesus and try to connect them to it. I just don't hang out with these people because they're cool people or I like hanging out with them. I either am being sharpened by them or I want to sharpen them, one of the two. Then I begin to look at all these different areas of my life and my, oh, my kids play soccer. I want to try to get their soccer coach to, to church on Sunday. Then everything that I do revolves around Jesus. Then you'll find out what life is really about. Jesus isn't a bolt on to your crazy life that you got going on. Jesus is your life when you do it right. But Jesus is not only our life, he's our eternal life. We find our earthly life in Jesus. We find our eternal life in Jesus. Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse number 24, Very, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. No condemnation for you, child of God. You've passed from death into life. Oh, your, your earthly death, yeah, that's just a, a, a transitory period from point A to point B that gets you to being forever with the Lord. What a gift to look forward to. And again, I have 100% certainty when I draw my last breath here on planet Earth, I'm, I am with King Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Guaranteed. You know why? Because of the promises of the Word of God. Not because I'm a good person, not because I've done good things. I, I'm a wretched, wicked, horrible, despicable, vile, wretched sinner apart from the grace of God. But because of the grace of God, I am righteous, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Finally, we find joy in walking with Jesus. Oh, this is good. This is really, really good. I, I, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. Uh, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a doctor. But people often talk to me about their problems, and again, that's, that's helpful because you have a spiritual leader who will guide you through spiritual things. Oftentimes, I talk with people who are struggling with depression. Pastor, I'm just sad all the time. I'm down in the dumps. I can't pull myself out of it. I don't know what to do. One of the first questions that I ask in cases like that, is there any unconfessed sin in your life or sin that you continue to run back to that you think will provide joy but only provide sadness? No lie, like, Eight times at least, probably nine times out of ten, the answer to that question is yes. And I say this, sin always robs your joy. Don't be surprised by that. Now, you might have a chemical imbalance. You might need to go on medication. You might need to talk to a, a specialist about some type of trauma or issue that you've gone through. Fine. But don't neglect spiritual solutions for spiritual problems. You will not get your joy back by taking, you know, 25 milligrams of X, ever. You get your joy back by being plugged into Jesus. Jesus says this in, in John chapter 15. Uh, it's in your notes. Read it with me. John 15, verses 10 through 11. I'm going to read this and we're, uh, explain this and we're done. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Get this. This, this works for me. Maybe some people are weird like me, and this works for you. If, if so, I want to help you. Everybody else, just hang tight for a minute. We'll be done, okay? I think of our joy as this, like, a, a joy tank, and we have a, a, ta a, a gauge on it, like our gas gauge in our car, right? Our joy tank, by default, is empty, and the only thing that can produce joy in your life is the Holy Spirit at work in your life. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy right? Joy comes from the Holy Spirit, not from my circumstances, or I got a new car, or I got a promotion, or anything like that. Joy comes from Jesus. Our joy is at zero, empty. But Jesus says, if you obey me, I'm going to give you my love. And then when you abide with me, that's the whole point of, of John 15, that we're abiding in Christ. Jesus is saying this, stay connected to me, and I'm going to put my joy in you so that your joy might be full. Jesus is like, I want to top you off. But I don't want to top you off. I want to keep you topped off as long as you stay plugged into me. So when you're walking with Jesus, you will have joy. He said, well, my joy is at about halfway. I would ask the question, are you abiding in Jesus? If not, don't be surprised by that. 
Now, could, could something else be sucking your joy? You might have a joy leak somewhere. You might, might need to get it checked out. But let me tell you this. If you don't have, if you're a Christian, you're a child of God, you've been born again, and you don't have joy, you need to run a diagnostic on your heart because there's something wrong somewhere. Lack of joy is like the check engine light on your car. What does that mean? I don't know. Maybe you forgot to screw on your gas cap. Maybe your transmission's about to fall out. It just means something's wrong and you need to diagnose. Now, wouldn't it be awesome if we had a, a little computer to plug into that place under our heart and kind of read the codes on it? It's just like, oh, that's what it is. <laughs> Funny, right? God already gave us one. <laughs> it's his word. God, God, show me why I'm lacking joy. God, I'm going to dig into your word today, and I need you to speak to me because something's not right. I know it's not right. I don't know how to make it right. I've confessed all my sin, but God, I need joy, and you promised to give it to me, and, and, and God, I need you to make good on your promise today. God's like, I got you. And we can self-diagnose with the word of God as far as why we have a joy leak because as Christians, we should be joy-filled Christians. Does that mean we can't have a bad day? No, it, you can have bad days. I've had plenty of them. I've had bad days this week, but you know what? I haven't let it steal my joy because my joy comes from the fact that I am a child of God, and when all the garbage of this life is over, I'm going to be with Jesus and no more sin, no more suffering, and everything's awesome. I've got to maintain that joy, and we do that by staying connected to Jesus. And so, again, verse 11 promises us the joy by being sons and daughters of God. Do you have joy? Man, if you don't, you need, you need to check your heart. And, and again, you say, hey, I tried that. I don't know what to do. Make an appointment to talk with your pastor. I want to help you find joy because it's part of the Christian life. Most important thing in the world, you don't know nothing about this if you're not a child of God. You don't have joy. You don't have a father. You're not a son. You're not a daughter. You're an enemy. And so I want to help you find and follow Jesus with your life. Most important thing ever. So maybe you heard saying, say, Pastor, I've never been saved. I've never been born again. It's as simple as putting your faith in Jesus today. You don't have to become a Baptist. You don't have to join our church. You don't have to get baptized. But you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, that he's the only way to heaven. And you have to be willing to confess your sin and ask God for forgiveness. And if you're willing to do that, you can be born again in a split second today. And you can be called son. You can be called daughter. And more importantly, you can call God your father. For those of us that are Christians today, hey, how's your joy? Are you living in a way that makes your father proud of you? I talked to somebody this past week who's struggling with sin, and she said to me, she said, I just want to live in a way that makes, insert family member's name, proud. And I said, oh, if you're a child of God, you got somebody bigger than that you need to make proud. That's your heavenly father. And I said, I asked her if she'd been born again. She said she had. She gave me her salvation testimony. And I said, you're a child of God. And she says, I know. And I said, but you're a rebellious, disobedient child that breaks her father's heart. She said, I know. Good. Let's fix it. That might be you today. Rebellious, disobedient child that breaks your father's heart. Good. Fix it today. Completely solvable. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God for that. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you.